is pure pandering. I'm not a leader. So um, I just added, I could have said like golf course superintendents or whatever, so I just said readers. <laughs> Everyone's asking me, so what do you read? And I go, I don't read anything. So, um, and, uh, and I really appreciate the uh, uh, Greg inviting me and I have a better understanding of why I was invited. So I welcome the opportunity and um, away we go. So um, in our program, we've evaluated well over 50 crops, probably more than that, because sometimes we evaluate a crop and we, we, we grow one and it doesn't work. And we know why it doesn't work and we don't grow it again. But I would say in earnest, probably 50 crops. And I'm going to go through these very quickly, some of them more intensely. And it kind of goes from easy to um, really difficult, if not impossible. And I'll talk about why that is. And, and over time, and it wasn't intention, we kind of created this system that we use to evaluate these crops. Uh, for me, it started in 1993. This is Holyoke, Massachusetts. Holyoke has the largest Puerto Rican population as a percentage of any city in the United States. And they initiated this uh, organization called Huesos Raices, which means our roots. And it's to emphasize their roots in agriculture. Um, and um, in 1993, they called UMass, where the land grant institution, and they wanted someone that spoke Spanish that could give a talk on soil fertility. And I speak Spanish, so I went and gave a talk on soil fertility. And this meeting, uh, this, this, you know, there were like 30 people there, and it just completely changed my program and what, uh, uh, and what I've been working on. And so I, I did the thing on soil fertility, and then they're talking to me about crops that they grow. And so these are the things in Spanish, you know, so tomatoes, onions, uh, cilantro, pretty straightforward. Calabasa, I, I didn't have experience in the Caribbean with uh, uh, the Spanish that I knew. Um, I knew it was a type of squash, but I had no idea how popular. And then ahi dulce, uh, ahi is a term for pepper in the Caribbean, and then culantro. And I'll talk a little bit about these. But what struck me is that Puerto Ricans are our number one uh, Latino group in Massachusetts. They're quite possibly the largest Latino group in the Northeast of the United States. Um, and these are crops that are very popular with this community, and they, they're trying to grow them and they can't find them many times in their markets, and that, that really struck me, so I saw that as an opportunity. Um, so I'm always looking for slides that show the, the kind of demographics, I mean, we're a country of immigrants, and the immigrants keep changing, and I saw this in the Pew Research uh, Center, uh, and this is uh, in uh, 1910, and you know, so all these groups from Europe, for the most part, except for three, three states where they're from Mexico. Uh, and then, so keeping with um, uh, from Europe, so this is, a, this is a newspaper that I picked up in East Boston. East Boston has a very, had a very large Italian population. What, what do you notice about this, this uh, newspaper that seems a little unusual or different? The subtitle. What's that? The subtitle. Yeah, the subtitle, it's in English. So it used to be in Italian. And it's in English because there aren't a lot of Italian Americans that speak Italian anymore. I mean, that's kind of the history of our country. We have these immigrant groups, they maintain their language and culture, uh, and then they start to become American. Um, we have the largest Portuguese speaking population in the country. We have the largest Portuguese uh, of Portugal in the country. And like many immigrant groups, they, uh, they have their, their festivals, and food is always a really important part of these festivals. There are these women, and they bring traditional bread, and then they have this big feast, and the, uh, with the Portuguese is a little different. They, a lot of those groups came later, so there's still a lot that speak Portuguese. But food is a really important part of these cultures. And uh, can anyone tell me what this crop is? Brassball or Asia. <laughs> collards. This is collards in the Azores. So uh, the, mo the majority of the Portuguese that we have in Massachusetts are from the Azores. Uh, I had a colleague from Portugal. He said, if you want to know where the Portuguese went, follow the collards. <laughs> they took collards and they basically, when they went to Asia, they went into Africa and they brought collards and they would colonize and they would grow collards. Collard is a very uh, flexible crop that can grow, can grow in many different cultures. And when the slaves went from, were brought from uh, Africa to the south, they brought collards with them because it was introduced by the Portuguese. Um, 
So this is, you know, these are the type of things that have represented opportunities for farmers in our country for, for, for ever since we started getting uh, immigrants here, is they would bring um, uh, desires for part, parts of their cuisine that are popular. Um, and this is uh, Brazil, this is in uh, Minas Gerais in the uh, countryside, collards. I mean, this is the tropics, and collards, uh, the, the national dish of, uh, Portu of uh, Brazil is uh, feijoada, and it always comes with collards, and it goes very well here. Um, this is Chinese broccoli. In uh, Asia, it was thought that it was a wrapper. There's a lot of brassica wrapper in, in Asia. And this is uh, uh, brassica laracea. Again, brought by the Portuguese and selected in Asia for this type of uh, crop. And here we are in Massachusetts. We've grown collards forever, ever since I've been working with vegetable farms for 30 years. And I never really knew why. I didn't know much about the Portuguese culture. And here's kale on the right and collards. And uh, we have a uh, very popular soup in uh, southeastern Mass in, in uh, Cape called Portuguese soup, also called kale soup. I assumed it was kale, but it's collards. I show this picture to people from, uh, that are Portuguese, and they say, what the hell is that? <laughs> they have, you know, this is what they call colby. Somehow colby in Portuguese became kale, and I'm not sure how. Um, so. Uh, now we're in 2013, and a lot of people, when they think of Latinos, they think of Mexicans. Uh, and you can see here, now this is, this is the, the number one immigrant group in each state. And so, obviously there's many other immigrants in these states. Um, uh, but um, you can see it's dominated by Mexico, except for the Northeast. And here, again, the number one immigrant group. Now, one thing that's not here, a Puerto Rican. Why not Puerto Rican? They're What's that? They are Americans. Yeah, they're Americans, the citizens. So they're, you know, they, if they if they were in this, they would probably be the number one in Massachusetts, possibly the number one in New York, definitely the number one in Connecticut. But they're citizens. Um, and uh, I could make the case that in, in New York, it's not. Dominican Republic, but maybe Mexico. There's a huge Mexican population in uh, New York. Uh, I could do that for most of the states. But it's much more diverse here than it is in the rest of the country. Um, I could also make the case that we have the largest Brazilian population in the country in Massachusetts. It's over 250,000. Um, but many of them are undocumented. And the census does not do a very good job in measuring uh, undocumented immigrants. So, you know, we've heard a lot about the Latino population growing. Uh, by the year 2060, it might be uh, 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 up to 120 million. So these markets are going to continue to expand. However, a lot of these Latinos are here are going to start to assimilate. And perhaps they won't have as strong an affinity for some of these crops. We'll, we'll see how that goes. So in terms of Latinos, uh, as I showed in the previous slide, Mexicans are 64.1%, but not so much in our region. Certainly not in New England. We're starting to get some Mexicans, but not a lot. New York has a large amount. But look at the second is Puerto Rican, the third is Cuban, uh, then Salvador Rodrigo, a very large Salvador population in our region, and then the fifth is Dominican. Puerto Rican, Cuban, and Dominican have very similar cuisine, and we've been doing a lot of work with uh, cuisine popular with those groups. So Puerto Ricans, uh, there's a heavy concentration in the Northeast. There's more, uh, Puerto Rico's going through a lot of economic problems and a lot of now going to Florida, but the dominant group is in the Northeast. The same with Dominicans, a heavy amount in, uh, in uh, the Northeast. Cubans are more uh, centered down here in uh, Florida. We do have some in uh, New Jersey, uh, but our focus has been more with Puerto Ricans and Dominicans. Uh, so uh, back to these, uh, these crops, you know, tomatoes are pretty straightforward, onions and cilantro, uh, but I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, calabasa. So what's in a name? Well, there's many different names for this in Latin America. I do a lot of work in these countries, uh, calabasa, auyama, ayote, sopayo, there's many others in Bolivar and Brazil, uh, also butternut squash, because most of these are compared to moshad. There are some different species. Uh, but in my experience, a large percentage of them, at least in these hard squashes with orange flesh, that's the key. And what we learned is it doesn't matter as much what the outside looks like as much as the inside. And they're looking for orange flesh. 
So in the embassies of Christians, I took in these countries, Venezuela, Dominican Republic, Cuba, Costa Rica. And uh, you know, we open these up, and they've got orange flesh. And I just, this is kind of my uh, globalization slide. This is butternut squash. And uh, it's called Waltham butternut because it was developed by a breeder at the Waltham field station in uh, Massachusetts. And it's being grown in Honduras. And the breeder went to Central America to get germplasm. Brought it back to Waltham Mass and created it. And then uh, uh, here we are. So, so there's no hybrid breeds. This is a real issue. For a lot of these crops, especially crops that are grow, uh, popular in the kind of rural areas, and where are the immigrants coming from? A lot of the immigrants are coming from rural areas. Um, but the calabasa are you know, no hybrid varieties. It's all open pollinated. The standard practice in these areas is to save seed. And think about, you know, cucurbits, uh, monoecious plants. Uh, think of the outcrossing that happens. And you can see that in some of the previous slides. So Don Maynard at the University of Florida and Linda Beaver at the University of Puerto Rico and Maya Glez created this uh, hybrid variety. And when this came out, we were pretty excited and we did. This was, uh, that came out in the mid 90s. Don gave me some seed that I trialed. It grew very well in our, in our climate. Uh, and eventually, it, they, uh, it was, it's now picked up by uh, Rupp Seed, who they call uh, Sedea. And uh, went to Colorado Squash, but the variety is called uh, Sedea. It goes very well in our climate. So we do what we do, right? I, I got a graduate student, and uh, this was in the late 90s. And uh, we did trials, and we looked at different you know, practices. Um, uh, and anyway, we got good yields. Uh, we, we, we talked with some growers about the opportunity. We gave them seed, they grew it, and then they harvest it and they call me and say, well, where do I sell it? I say, I don't know, just sell it. Uh, I don't do that anymore. So ever since then, there's been a heavy emphasis on the marketing and promotion of these crops. Uh, and, and we learn a lot, not just about the marketing promotion, but also about the, um, the desire and differences between the, the communities. So we did a trial, I had a graduate student, uh, then we did a trial again, and, the, and we expanded it to some other varieties, and I'll talk about these varieties as we go along. Uh, but it was not just to, so we just kind of confirmed, well, this is our research farm. Uh, so, I mean, we have many different varieties here that they're all prepared. It's a lot of them are shy, there's, there's a few other species. Uh, that look very similar. And so we have the calabasa, the caramelachata, the key, you know, so the orange flesh, that's the key. That's what we found. Um, that's the last area. The, it's amazing the kabocha, which is a Japanese type squash, um, which is a maximum. But again, all these orange, and I'll tell you why this has become much more common. Uh, this is in, uh, they call it a boba de moranga in, in Portuguese. Uh, this is an interspecific hybrid. Uh, it's a Japanese type uh, called Tetsu de Buto and a uh, Again, orange flesh. And so we did the trials. We got, you know, we got some of them didn't do very well, others did. Um, and then we started going into the markets. And so we went to this one section of uh, Boston with a large Puerto Rican population. The dad had to get a picture of this with his, chip, his kids. I didn't stage this. And he was just so excited to see his crop and his farm's market. Uh, and then this woman came up and she said, that doesn't look like calabasa. I want you to cut it open. And I want to make sure it's orange. And OK, so we cut it open. And it was orange. And so that she bought it. And, and I was very struck by that. Uh, and then we started going on into markets. And so many of the squash were cut up, which is unusual for us. In butternut squash, we buy a whole squash. Hybrid squash, even, which are pretty big, sometimes we'll buy the whole thing. But they're, they're, they're cutting it up. And the reason is they don't use a lot. When they buy it, they put a little bit in beans, a little bit in rice. They're not going to think of buy a big squash because they might not have the, the ability to storage. Sorry. So Washington Heights and Upper Manhattan, one of the largest uh, concentrations of Dominicans in the country, uh, we went there and uh, we went to 13 stores, and this is what I found with all of them, kabocha. And the key is that it's an orange, orange flesh. And notice how it's cut up. Now, you don't have to cut as much up because the kabocha is small. And sometimes, if they won't all be cut up, but ones at the top will be cut up to show it's orange flesh, and the others, they're small enough that someone would buy one, and it wouldn't be too much. And a lot of it was coming from Mexico. 
this is bad Spanish saying that it's uh, from Mexico. Uh, actually, Mexico grows a lot of kabocha for Japan. Uh, they, 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 they're one of the biggest exporters of kabocha to uh, Japan, which is a Japanese type of squash. So, product of Mexico. We found one store that had a traditional type of, of uh, Dominicans call it Aoyama, that was big, but still it was cut up. About 13 stores, and it was kabocha. Um, I, and so I want to talk just a little bit about this one. This is the, uh, the Portuguese, uh, the Brazilian type, called the Bola de Japonesa. The Bola means squash, Japanese, and Japanese. Brazil has the largest Japanese population in the world outside of Japan. Uh, and the Japanese brought kabocha to um, uh, Brazil, and they basically created this uh, interspecific hybrid. This is in, uh, and uh, we've done a lot of work in uh, Newark, uh, a very large Portuguese speaking we do a lot of surveys. Uh, it's just, we just do a lot of promotion in their media. This is, in, for a center, this is a type of uh, squash pop for Central America. It's called Hupiang. Uh, this is in a Brazilian press for the uh, uh, Brazilian squash. So this is a, a, a store in uh, Massachusetts. We have about 600 Brazilian stores. Uh, not all of them have fresh produce, but they're, you know, cultural things uh, like bodegas in Spanish that people will go, it's a cultural thing. And here's the, the Brazilian squash. Uh, I'm talking with the owner there. And uh, one of the things we found, it has longer shelf life than any other squash that we grow. And we grow a lot of squash. Uh, it's a very traditional thing in New England, as in many parts of the country. Uh, but the post-harvest was spectacular. And I met this person from, uh, we use in Tetsukabuto, and I met this person from Japan, and she said, in, in Japanese, I don't know if anyone speaks Japanese, they didn't even correct me, but they said it means iron helmet or unchoppable. And I'll tell you, it is unchoppable. I, I cut it in half and I bake it. Because you can't, you can't, I can't anyway. My wife and I like to cook, but we, I bake it. So, uh, so what happened is the Latinos started to prefer that because of its shelf life and it's small and it's orange. Uh, and this this is where we're harvesting and packing the, uh, the large one. This is the uh, last day up here. That's the uh, Brazilian one. These have to go in 50 pound mesh bags. They're a pain in the butt. <laughs> I mean, really a pain in the butt. The other thing is think about storing that. You know, uh, it, they, they kind of squash each other uh, and then here is the, the uh, Brazilian one in the Bushnell Knife box, much easier. And I think that's, and think about Washington Heights and the importance of space. So, uh, you know, all these factors I think are driving the uh, market except in these smaller squashes. Um, and that is really difficult, those 50 pound bags. And this is our terminal market, Chelsea Market. It's like Hunts Point in New York. This is the third largest terminal market in the country. We supply Eastern Canada and all of New England and other parts of the Northeast. And uh, this is a buyer for the growing ethnic market and the terminal market. It's the growth area. A lot of these immigrant groups want things that are really important in their cuisine. Uh, and this is actually a kabocha, but he also buys the uh, Brazilian one. And um, he prefers this because they last longer. He doesn't get as much spoilage. And he communicates directly with the buyers. So we work a lot with him. He's a very important person in what we do and others like him. So one of the problems we're having, I, I think I, I don't know if there's someone today or I heard someone go by top of capsaicin. This is a huge issue in our state. Squash is 25% of the acreage that we grow in Massachusetts. Uh, we have, this is actually our research farm. I can't afford to do research on cucurbits um, anymore in any serious way. Because uh, I mean, we get 48 inches of rain a year in Western Mass. And uh, this was a two acre trial that was completely uh, devastated. So that's a real issue. And so we really have need, so you really you need a real breeder for that, not me, to look at ways that you can address that. So back to the uh, uh, immigrant groups. Uh, so uh, uh, Puerto Ricans and Dominicans, they all use, and Cubans, they call it uh, recaito or sofrito. This is a staple uh, in these cuisines. And, and to a certain extent, some other countries like Venezuela. But, so this is Goya. So I wasn't sure, anyone from Goya here? Okay, good. So uh, this is terrible. This is like really bad. 
Uh, and, but Sofrito is a very, I mean, any Latino store you go into is going to have a lot of uh, Goya products. It has a very good reputation. So here's the ingredients. Um, 42 ingredients. Latinos have higher rates of diabetes, hypertension, obesity, the general population. Puerto Ricans have a, the highest rates among uh, Latinos. And that's a, probably on the one. Dominicans might be larger now, but it's hard to say. So the salt, salt is three times. Um, soybean oil, olive oil, canola oil. This is my favorite. This is the fat of bacon. Bacon <laughs> fat. And it is really tasty. Uh, but not the greatest thing for our people that have hypertension and diabetes. And then this is brown sugar. So this is a traditional recipe. Six ingredients. Onions grow very well in our climate. These are Cuban oil peppers, also called Italian oil peppers, grow well in our climate. Garlic, grow well in our climate. Cilantro, ditto. This is Kulantu. This one's tough. And this is Adimose. So here we have uh, a dominant Latino group, Puerto Ricans, Dominicans, and Cubans, although not within our area. And this is a staple for them. And what an opportunity for our farmers. So uh, just so this is, uh, uh, I've got projects in Cuba. This is actually in Cuba where they call it Ajicachucha. Um, excellent quality in Cuba. I think I mentioned something more about it. But many different names. Capsule Chinese, so the same genus and species as habanero peppers, which is an issue with outcrossing. I was in, um, when I was in Brazil uh, for meetings last, uh, in the fall, and I was so fascinated that they, they found out that Chinese is actually from the Amazon. Uh, and this, um, and the other interesting thing is that this is, uh, as I said in the so this is uh, uh, a capsule Chinese is sweet. This is culantro. This is cilantro. And this is uh, scallions. So very similar, what they call shadow badging. Uh, and you know how that kind of went from there and then all, all together kind of came up to the Caribbean, I found really fascinating. Um, and those are just the names in Portuguese. But I was so tickled by that. Um, so this is the Dominican Republic many years ago. And that's the ahi dulce back there, what they call ahi cachucha there, uh, terrible quality. There's the Cuban oil peppers. I think one of the reasons why they use Cuban oil peppers is it's a similar color. That's just a guess. Um, and that's what we used to be importing. This picture is probably 50 or 20 years old. Terrible quality. But that's all that the markets could get. So they, they got it. So we started actually about in the early 2000s looking at ahi dulce. We brought in, this is our ahi dulce that we got from the University of Puerto Rico. And this was from a bodega. And, they, and, and Puerto Rican said, what the hell is that? <laughs> that doesn't look like our ahi dulce. And he said, but I said, you know, me, like non-Latino. He said, who the hell are you selling, selling us that? That's ahi dulce. <laughs> so we had to spend some time on that. Although what's happened, I took this picture last year in the Dominican Republic, and their quality has gone up. Actually, the Dominican Republic is the major exporter of Ahi uh, This is what they call Ahi Cachucha, and this is Ahi Custoso. They use them interchangeably. And, and again, Cuban peppers. So this is in Puerto Rico, uh, and this is coming from a breeder named Linda Beaver, uh, who's really up the quality. There are, again, no hybrid varieties of this, and no, no um, um, stable lines. So it's all people, it's a, people just save seed. That's all they do. Um, and I like this, this is the market of Puerto Rico, and they have the, the only ingredients for so people, the Cuban oil peppers, the avi dulce, the garlic, and the onions. They don't have the cilantro and, and uh, curanto because they're leaky greens. This is at a market in uh, Lawrence. Lawrence is 92% uh, Latino now. When I was growing up, not too far from Lawrence, there was no idea of that. And again, Cuba, they call them Italian fine peppers but also for the purpose. Outcrossing has become a huge issue. And one of the reasons is the largest export is the Dominican Republic, and they export more habanero than I can use it. Dominicans, <coughs> Puerto Ricans, and Cubans do not eat hot peppers. It's not tradition. In Puerto Rico, they'll have something on the table called pique, but it's uh, sweet peppers. Uh, Dominicans are growing for export. Uh, these peppers are very complicated for us to grow, which I'll, previous I'll talk about. But it's, a, it's become a real issue, and it's direct, directly reduced the market. Because I talk with many Puerto Ricans and Dominicans, and you say, I'm, I, I can't risk buying something, and then it's too hot. Um, this is uh, Cuba. Cuba has some spectacular ahi dulce. 
Uh, and I already said I'm on the breeder, right? But it's been in isolation for like 56 years. I found that interesting. Um, but really, really beautiful, excellent quality, really sophisticated, very savory. Uh, I, in the, my worth, I, if it was any other country, I would have brought that city, but I didn't want to risk it. Uh, so we got four lines from uh, Dr. Beaver. Uh, and again, these, have been, these are open pollinated, um, but they've been selfed for five generations. They're fairly stable. Um, so we looked at these, our research farms. So we, we looked at, uh, we had replicated trials, and we also grew some for marketing. This is at the outside, and we also have a high tunnel. Uh, as I mentioned, 48 inches of rain, boy, I, I want more high tunnels, they're spectacular. Uh, earlier yield, longer yield, um, uh, and this is uh, Dr. Lini Marchese, is a breeder uh, from Brazil who worked with me for two years. And uh, we got excellent yields, I mean, really good yields. Um, last time we grew it in the late 90s, it was much less than this, uh, so these, they did very well. But it, so then we, we wash it according to GAP standards, we pack it. Uh, this is our pack. It's in a bushel, a half bushel. We put 10 pounds. Um, this is not traditional, but again, we had to work with the markets to make sure that we were, these were like the real thing. Uh, and then we started getting out into the markets. This is a, a market in Worcester, Massachusetts, the second largest city in New England. Uh, and this guy is the most important. His name is Jose. He's the market manager, the produce manager. Um, this is my colleague, uh, who's, as you can tell, is now in Trinity. Uh, but uh, uh, they bought 150 pounds a week, and that's one store of hundreds in the region. Um, and the importance of bodegas, corner stores, this is Abreu and Worcester. Uh, they would buy one case. In fact, they would like to buy half a case. Uh, we can't do that. but. Uh, that's a traditional thing, and the way we do that is we go through the terminal market. This is another uh, vendor in the terminal market uh, would buy thousands of pounds, uh, and then the, the smaller stores would get their produce from them. So we found it very important to understand this uh, system. And this is the traditional way that Aki's are brought in from the Dominican Republic, in 30 pound sacks. We don't do that for various reasons. One, I don't know how to fill them, but also uh, we, need, we, we need to be able to stack them. Uh, so, for every crop that we do, we do what's called an enterprise budget. And the enterprise budget that we do has the, what are called the variable costs, not the fixed costs. So we don't put in for a farm their taxes, their loans, um, any other things that they have to buy that are separate from the actual production of the crop. The reason is that a farmer can take this and add their fixed costs. They can also change any of the variable costs. We call them variable costs because they vary according to production. And the standard is to do an acre so you can compare. If you're going to consider five different crops, they'll all be in one acre no matter how many you're going to grow. Um, so, uh, one of the biggest issues with this, and that's similar with many crops, it's small and it doesn't weigh anything. That's strike two, right? So. Uh, a, ten, a, a half bushel box is 10 pounds. We estimated that one person can harvest 30 pounds an hour. Harvest, wash, and pack. So 1,026 hours. We use $13 an hour, that's the H2A, the, in our state it's mainly Jamaicans, but that's uh, what they're paid, and also farmers have to pay housing and so on. Uh, and, whoops, and machinery hours are $20 an hour. So, uh, Oops, sorry. Uh, so here's our uh, total labor costs, uh, $15,695 an acre. Now, we were getting $2 a pound. That's, that shouldn't be a dollar, sorry. That should be just $30,899. So gross, uh, $61,600. Uh, and I'll talk about that $2 a pound in a minute. But then you subtract all the, the material costs, the labor costs, 26,026. That's spectacular. That's really good. Now, that's not including the fixed costs, but I'm going to get to that price in a second. But labor is 44% of the total variable costs. So here's our competition, the Dominican Republic. We're in Massachusetts, and we compete directly with the Dominican Republic. Uh, and the Dominican Republic shares uh, Hispaniola with Haiti, and that's their main labor source. 
uh, there's been a lot of news and uh, a lot of the Dominican Republic is trying to uh, export or, or send a lot of their Haitians out of the country for various reasons. But the, um, the uh, minimum wage in the Dominican Republic is $2.67 a day, not an hour. It's $5.50. It actually just went up in Mexico to $5.50. Many don't get that. But that's our competition. And you'd think, well, they're so far away, but they're really not. Uh, and so I kind of did this just guesstimating with the Dominican Republic. So $2.66, uh, I'm sorry, that should be a day. I shouldn't put out. $2.60 a day, $5 a day for machinery costs, total labor $3,170. So here's their total labor costs, $3,253. Also, uh, I put $500 for transplant production because we, it cost us about $14 a, a, a flat of 72s. It's going to be much cheaper there. Also, they're using mesh bags. I, I should have pointed that out before, but we're paying over $1,000 uh, uh, an acre for the wax boxes. So, um, and I kept, instead of uh, this in the previous enterprise budget, that is uh, 10472 we, we go through a grower cooperative and we pay 17%. And so when we grow it, it's uh, 10,000. So I put that for export costs. But costs are much cheaper. And it's not that they, these go on container boats. Uh, and the cost per item is not that high. So fortunately or unfortunately, whoops. Fortunately or unfortunately, uh, um, in 2000, in March the 23rd, so a couple months before we came into production, the Dominican Republic was quarantined 20 different fruits and vegetables, including all peppers. Uh, so all of a sudden, our competition went away, and it was a, it was a free for all. Before we came into production, it was $13.99 a pound. And after we left production, it was $13.99 a pound. During production, it was maybe $4 or $5 uh, retail price. Um, but that, would, that allows us to get $2 a pound. If the Dominican Republic is in production, it would be a dollar a pound at most. A dollar a pound is not viable. There's no way we can grow lahi dosas for a dollar a pound. Not with all the costs that are associated with that. Um, so I'll, I'll skip this. We've got a project that I'm really excited about from the USDA. It's a very large grant to double the, the value of SNAP, what used to be called food stamps. And uh, these are just some of the cities. Uh, in Boston, 41.5% of the school system is Latina. Yeah. Uh, you know, some of these are, you know, in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and percent. And our job is going to be work with farmers to grow cross popular these different energy groups. Um, so I want to show our commercial. It's a 30-second commercial on Louis Vuitton, just to give you a flavor of the um, kind of uh, marketing component. This is a film that we uh, produced for $7,000 for Louis Vuitton. It's our commercial, so we own it and we use it for promotion. Uh, I play the campesino. And, uh, everyone else is Latino in the... Uh, in the, uh, in the video, so and so it's 30 seconds. Uh, I'll show it, and then uh, I'll, I'll I'll describe it. Mi amor, ayúdame con la comida. Sí, abuelita, ¿qué necesitas? Vamos a hacer una receta que se suena a nuestros platos típicos. ¿Cuál es la receta mágica? Sofrito. Este, ay, no. Este tiene demasiados ingredientes: sal, aceite, azúcar. Vamos a hacer uno fresco con ingredientes de la granja con cebolla, ahí es dulces, pimientos verdes, ajo, cilantro y recados. Se pone todo en la procesadora, ya, todo listo, fresco y saludable. <risa> ¡Qué rico! <risa> okay. um, it's a, so, this was uh, developed by Puerto Ricans in my program, so it's a grandmother talking to the granddaughter and just a traditional thing, and the granddaughter brings out the sofrito. We, we digitize so it didn't say sofrito. We gotta get letters for that one. Uh, and just saying, no, not that, we're gonna make it from scratch. And so we see this as a great opportunity for our farmers to grow these crops, but we, there's the promotional component that is uh, really important. Okay, so, you know, we have uh, recipes that we're promoting, so there's a lot of promotion. These are a lot of my grad students and postdocs. Uh, again, a lot of promotion with the community. And this feeds back to the growers. So how to grow Aki Dulce? Uh, I should have done this before. 
this is a website that uh, I maintain. So uh, we've got a new version that's coming out, but uh, what we do is we have information on all these crops. So you go to the Americas, you go to Puerto Rico, and these are crops that we have. You go to Ahi Dulce. So it has information on production specific to Ahi Dulce. And then for production, it brings us to the New England Management Guide and says go to Peppers. go to peppers and all the information about peppers in terms of weed control, insect control, disease control, are all the same. We put in the site things that are a little different. You have to start it two or three weeks earlier, uh, some other things specific to that. So a lot of the crops, like the same with the calabasa, uh, we go right to the site. And we have a new site that will be coming out shortly. To the uh, and, you know, by the way, it's, it's spectacular. My wife and I make it all the time. I highly recommend it. So, this is uh, many different names Polanto, Recao, Cilantro, and all the I saw this site 57 different names for Polanto. We call it Origin Fatinum. Uh, this is in Costa Rica. This is the major exporter of Polanto to our region. Very sophisticated system. And what we found is they really have the perfect climate. But so I, you know, so again, we go, we do. I got a graduate student, and we looked at uh, shading. There's a lot of places that will be shading, for reasons I'll show. Um, and one of the issues is that it keeps producing in our climate uh, flowers, and the market doesn't want flowers. The market wants this, and they want them very subtle, They're subtle. They don't want them hard like they are here. Um, anyway, we, you know, published a paper on that, uh, basically showing that with the more light that, that we reduce, the, the lower the yield went down because of all the photosynthesis. We did reduce the flower production, but not enough. We could never come close. And we just left this in a greenhouse in the summer. And uh, this is the month, this is the leaves we got, and these are all flowers. And so here's 16 hours of light, which you're not going to get that in Costa Rica. And then uh, 12 hours. So, so this is one that it could be grown. We do have some people that are going in their gardens, but uh, commercially we just don't see a, a way to do that at this stage. So, so now one is very different. This is not like anything else. Actually, it's very similar to alfalfa. But this is a crop grown. We have uh, uh, about 200,000 Guatemalans and Salvadorans in our in our state. There's about six or seven hundred thousand in New York where we do some work. Um, I saw this. We had a project, a USAID project in El Salvador. And I saw this, and I asked people around, and said, oh, it's just like a weed. You know, people in the countryside use it as a countryside. And that's where the countries are coming from. So I go back into Massachusetts, and this is what I find. All frozen. No fresh on top. And I said, we want fresh. We don't want frozen. But we can't get it. So we got seed through uh, USDA, through APHIS. And uh, we grew it like we grow any other vegetable. Black plastic, six feet on center, double row. Um, I'll put them in a row. The one problem we had was potato leaf harbor. And because this is unlike, this is not calabasa and this is not ahi dulce, we're really restricted in what we can use for pest management. So we can't use what you can use for alfalfa. So we could use this one uh, called Pygani. It's not, it's terrible. $500 a gallon. And it's terrible. So we use row cover. Very expensive. And so we have to think about the enterprise budget, right? Uh, I wasn't I wasn't a uh, popular person that day. Uh, <laughs> so this is underneath. So one advantage of the row cover, not only does it protect us from the the, the um, uh, leaf hopper, but also we get added heat and uh, growth. So we had to figure out everything. We can't do it like in El Salvador. So how to cut it, how to pack it. Again, in this one we use uh, red half bushel boxes. Uh, this is actually in Long, in, uh, Long Island, New York. 
uh, huge solid worm population there. They were ecstatic about it. Um, this is the first time we introduced him to a supermarket in Massachusetts, and they were suspicious of me, um, but they, <laughs> they knew that. And 5.99 pound retail, we've been able to maintain that price. Four dollars a pound wholesale, uh, six dollars a pound retail. Seed is an issue. So this is in southern Mexico, where it's also popular, although we think this is a different species. Corvary Rondestado is the one from El Salvador. They have both in Brazil. But C, and Aphistado was on the federal ranches weed list. They allowed us to import it for research. Now it's not, they know it's not on it, so we bring it in. But I just brought this in last week, or two weeks ago, from El Salvador. 11% uh, germination, and that's good. I was ecstatic. I brought it in, I brought it in two years ago, 2%. Uh, that's an issue. Uh, and that's a kind of a, a, a roadblock right there. Well, not a roadblock, you can still bring it in, but that's an issue. Um, so we can't go to the vegetable management, this is our vegetable management card. There's no, there's no, nothing similar uh, to, uh, okay, so uh, I'm gonna kind of end with this one, I think, and keep me honest with time. So I teach vegetable crops, and this is a very important root crop. They're called uh, aroids. In English, we call them tanya, tanya and taro. Uh, taro. Um, this is in uh, Brazil. Uh, this is actually a graduate student. This is her farm. She did her master's with me. This, she, this is a coffee farm. And it grows like a weed there. Uh, Xanthosoma sagifolium. Uh, in Brazil, they call it caioba. It's also popular in uh, West Africa. And it's about as, so whenever we talk about root crops, they say, well, there's all these aeroids that are really important, but don't worry about them. You can't grow them here. Uh, and we can't grow the root, but the leaf grows very well in our climate. And I and, and the colored uh, we have a large community population too. And I knew that, but we, so these are aeroids. Colocascus polenta. So I mean we grow these as bedding plants, so why can't we grow that? So I, I called a colleague in uh, Visosa in Brazil and he, he got some corns. And uh, this is in my yard. This is this is Kaiola. Uh, and we're at sixteen hundred feet in Western Mass. So I got a graduate student, and um, this is at a research farm. This had just been cut, so we cut them every other week. Uh, excellent quality. I, I, uh, I think it's in those uh, facilities here, so I'm not, not going to say that our quality is better, but it's better. <laughs> um, so just spectacular quality. And this is like truly tropical. So uh, I, had a, I, I was going to show a video on that. It's, uh, it's called Hedge Global. It's, uh, all Brazilians in the United States, and we have about 1.5 million Brazilians in the United States. We have the largest Brazilian population in the country in Massachusetts. They all watch Hedge Global. Um, it's called a Hedge Global International. And uh, we did a commercial, and we advertised this event. And so we have Mashishi, which is a type of cucumber <coughs> popular there, and uh, Taioba and Jiro is a big plant. We've done a lot of work with Jiro. Uh, it's very popular with Africans and Brazilians. So we set this up at a supermarket. And then we said, okay, you can buy. And it was unbelievable. <laughs> Absolutely unbelievable. I've never seen anything like it. Uh, and the next day I called my friend in Sosa and said, I need a graduate student. And because uh, I want a Brazilian. Why? Because of the of the language and the promotion and marketing. This always has to be that component in the work. And I speak Portuguese. But I can't promote it like a Brazilian, you know, a native can do it. But it was unbelievable. The produce manager was beside himself. He kind of like had to stop it all and, you know, kind of try to make oil. And no way. They wanted nothing to do with it. <laughs> I mean, it only had, uh, I don't know, a few hundred pounds and it went in like 10 minutes. It was just unbelievable. <laughs> it was so cool. I got a, I, this is a major super. I got a call from the, uh, the head of produce uh, for the whole company. Um, so this is Zoraya Bajos, who's still working with me. Uh, and so we have to get corns. So we have to import them from Brazil. Really difficult. And we were able to do it two years in a row. Uh, yeah, I put in quotes, I, I said, it's, it's, it's not Obama. It's like close to it, but I always call it Obama. And I was trying to think of it last night. But what's happening in these countries, Brazil considers this theirs. Because the center of work origin is in the Amazon. So they consider that there. So it's becoming a little trickier to get this genetic material. So they were, so after a couple of years, they said, well, they didn't say no. They just kept putting it through these channels. So, um, uh, so we're looking at tissue culture, but you know, so far we haven't been able to find anything that makes it economically viable. Getting back to the, the enterprise budget, 
But um, uh, I'll kind of end with this, I think. So does anyone recognize him? Michael Pollan, Ami Wisselama. So Martha's Vineyard has a huge Brazilian population. So we did work there. And he came over, and he was really taken by this, and this, the Mishishi, and the, uh, and I say that because we're, we see opportunities for, um, we've, we've actually sold certified organic Tayoba to Whole Foods, I like it. We've sold this to non-traditional markets, so I think there's a lot of opportunities to diversify these crops. I put a nutrient density. Whole Foods have this thing with, uh, called Andy Scores, I don't know if you're familiar with it, it was like nutrient density, they're getting away from that. But anytime there's a Brazilian woman in Massachusetts that's pregnant, we get to call it. So it's recommended that when they're pregnant, they eat Tayoba. So, um, so I think I'll end on this one. Um, we've done a terrible job in um, promoting crops to the, we have a very large Asian and growing population. I've read that there are more Asians coming into uh, the United States than Latinos now. Um, and actually, this might be the crop that is produce the most value, and all I did was I, I, got, I went through the APHIS and made it legal to grow in Massachusetts. This is, this is on the federal not just me list. When I first saw it, I looked into it, and it's like illegal. Um, and so I, I went through our Department of Agriculture, I went through APHIS, it took a couple of years, and we were able to get it. It can only be grown in Massachusetts, it can't be exported outside of Massachusetts. I'm sure it is, but it's not supposed to be. Um, but I, I can't, I don't know what the numbers are, but uh, it's extremely popular. Mm -hmm. And probably because it's illegal. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not in our state. In our state, it's legal. In our state, it's legal. At one point during this process, I was threatened with a $250,000 fine from APHIS because I was working in this well. That was a bad thing. Um, so I think that's it. Questions for Dr. Megan from the audience? Hi. Yeah, so uh, I guess I have a couple of questions. The sure. first one is, you mentioned the cost of labor around 44%. Yes. Uh, so there's two questions to that. First of all, uh, from a breeder's perspective, is there any trade that you can uh, select and that will bring this price down? And from a farmer's perspective, uh, what is other things that could be grown? What are other things that could be grown and that have a lower uh, labor costs and essentially are competing uh, against this market. Sure. So um, the one on the how, what can be done by breeders. So we had a breeder that started to work a little bit on that drill stick. Mm -hmm. And one of the issues was the size. So we started selecting for size to make them bigger. Mm -hmm. We actually got some that were bigger with thicker walls. The problem is that we brought them to the market and they said, what the hell is that? It doesn't look like that drill stick. Mm -hmm. So uh, we didn't even get to the case because they said the size is just is too different. Um, and I'm sorry, the second question? What other crops are these competing with in terms of farmers actually buying this and committing to growing this? Oh, we've, we've introduced a lot. And you know, uh, as someone that works in production, yeah. uh, we can t I can talk to farmers about production practices and they'll share that. And we talk to them about marketing opportunities and select markets. They're very secretive about that. I mean, like the, uh, I know there's farmers that are going to want I have no idea how much. I have no idea what they're getting prices. I know what some of the farmers are working with, but um, so I mean we've got farmers growing Cuban bell peppers. Some of the things with the so people, uh, Cuban bell peppers, I can go say. Um, there's also something called Benihana dominicana, Dominican eggplant, uh, which is a purple type that we have farmers growing that for Latino communities. Brazilians, uh, the Brazilian squash, uh, the Gilo, which is a is that, is that is this what we're looking at? Or, or, or maybe other na native crops, olive crops that people always be grown in Massachusetts that don't have that labor cost and that are very essentially more profitable. We native to Massachusetts. Or that are that grow very well through okay. And farmers being resistant to growing something different. Well, so of all the major vegetables that we grow, none are native to the continent of the United States. Right? So everything is basically, I mean, starting with some of the best breeders in the world were the Native Americans that brought corn and squash up into our region and selecting as they went along. Um, but uh, of the 30,000 acres of vegetables that we have in Massachusetts, 70% of that is with crops that are from the tropics. So that's, that's the point of the Tioga. I mean, that is like as tropical as it goes really well in the climate. So, 
So keep your eyes, you know, open and uh, think you know, broadly in terms of what's going on. And what was flowering? I'm guessing that's uh, for the period response. Yes. The one that was flowering, and you don't want to flower because that's yes, it's photos period. So, so is there a, a different species that doesn't have photoperiod sensitivity that you can use to prove? Well, it's interesting. So, uh, culantro is native to the Americas, and I think that's why cilantro is so popular in, in, uh, in Latin America. So, culantro, I say if you don't like cilantro, don't eat culantro because it's even stronger. I love culantro. For whatever reason, it's popular with Vietnamese. I'm not sure why. Not with other Asian groups that I know of, but with Vietnamese. The market is huge, millions of dollars. Uh, uh, well, the, certainly in the northeast United States. Um, but that's why cilantro became so popular because it's easier to grow than cilantro. And so Latinos just adopted uh, to it. So I, I don't, you know, we didn't look at that at all. We, we basically looked at production, we couldn't get it, and so we moved on. But uh, it's a, it's a, I also think there's good um, opportunities to get that into non uh, Asian and Asian markets. But we didn't do really anything. So we've done a lot of work with that. We've done a lot of work with uh, immigrant growers. Uh, the question was about are we working with immigrant growers? And uh, USDA has been providing a lot of funds, and so we started working with them in about 10 years ago. We're not doing as much of that work. Although the first group I worked with was Nessus Raises, the organization that I mentioned. Um, in our state, uh, they're very small. They're still, you know, uh, you know, really small. So when we get information about a crop, we make it available to anyone. And um, actually this year, so this year is going to be complicated with that, people say, because Dominican Republic's back in the game. So uh, the key is going to be that USDA grant that's going to allow us to double snap, uh, because it can start making new, because our production costs are really high. Um, but we, we do work with them. Uh, I haven't been doing this work, more work, as much work directly. Um, but I would say that the majority of the production of these crops are with uh, uh, traditional growers, not with any growers, just because of their size. Yeah. For the taro production, is there a way to dig the corms and store them over the winter? Because I seem to remember hearing that for just growing in your garden for an ornamental. Obviously, that's pretty labor intensive for a production farm. But have you looked into that? I remember that summer like it was yesterday. <laughs> we dug them up and we. And what happened is we had, uh, for whatever reason, so we have two ubiquitous diseases in our soils, uh, uh, Rhizoctonia and Thickly. And for whatever reason, that species is very susceptible. And you know, and another thing with, especially growing it like that, there's not a lot of information. You know, if you try to get information on production on I can do so, which is a staple in what you're going to do in the in Cuba, it's very difficult to find that. But what we did find was papers that saying Rhizoctonia and Thickly. So we had disease issues, and they were exacerbated when we stored them. But that would never work for the enterprise budget. Just, I mean, I suppose you could figure out a way with maybe like an equipment or something to kind of dig them up, like a dig of potatoes, but then it'd have to be cleaned. And um, no, we need we need a source of the corns, uh, either through tissue culture, but I don't I don't think that's viable, um, or getting a way to import them. Uh, we have we actually have a project with them, but out that result to import some products popular with Brazilians in our region. Maybe we can add that to it. But I would love to be going back to that. Uh, it's, a, it's a spectacular crop. And, and non-Brazilians really like it um, because of its quality. I love it. Um, actually, the best is, is uh, best when it's in um, uh, uh, bacon fat. That's <laughs> spectacular, this bacon fat. Yeah. Um. Fascinating talk, thanks. Um, I was struck, I guess, by how entrepreneurial your your project is. You know, you, you have these enterprise budgets, you make advertisements, mm -hmm. all that stuff. And so you have your own budget uh, to, to do your research, but do you, do you try to keep track of, uh, or if there is any way, of how much value you bring to the state of Massachusetts through the, you know, commercialization of these, um, it, I mean, I try as best I can, uh, uh, but it's difficult again because farmers are very hesitant to share that information. But I would say maybe ten million dollars in retail sales of these crops that have never been grown in Massachusetts before in the last ten years. But that's a that's a guess. I mean, I've gotten calls about chipoline from Virginia, from Tennessee, 
you know, because once we're on the web, right, people know about it. And I know that there's people in some of these other states that are growing it. And if I really wanted to be a, a not a nice guy, I'd call A for something. Because <laughs> I'm sure they're not going to do anything legally that we are. But I, I think about it sometimes. Because <laughs> we, we were shipping it as far as uh, as far south as Washington, D.C., uh, which has about 500,000 solid units. But I, the exact numbers, I don't know. Right. I mean, you're, you're a good investment for the state of Massachusetts. Right? Depends on who you talk to, <laughs> yeah. including my wife. <laughs> uh, we have a question from the webinar. Uh, an important, uh, large part of the Indian population uses brinjal. They plant for their food. Uh, why are you not exploring that crop or working on it? Sure. So um, the largest Asian population in our, in our state is Chinese, and second is Asian Indian. And one of the difficulties with Asian Indian is they're not concentrated. So we have Chinatown in uh, Boston, Quincy, uh, Mass with large Chinese populations, and the Asian Indians disperse. So the, we haven't found a way to kind of get that into the pipeline, you know, to those just So I haven't. So the short answer is I haven't done much. Haven't done much work on it. We have evaluated some crops, but we we just didn't have the uh, energy and, and success in the marketing component. I would say. But yeah, eggplant. Uh, we actually did a project with fenugreek. Although it bolted in our climate, and uh, they do use the um, uh, the pod, but most want the leaf and the fenugreek that we evaluated uh, bolted to prematurely. Right, well, great. Thank you so much for your time. Great. Thank you.